How quickly time flies. One moment you're planning for the start of Ramadan, and the next time you look, we already past the halfway mark. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's Anur Delight. Dr. Taslim Ras has found his place in this life by serving the sick wherever he has gone. He has made the jump from doctor to academic and contributes to the learning of younger medical staff. We went to find out what drives this remarkable human being. From a young age, Taslim Ras had set his sights on entering the medical profession. It was both a dream and a goal that he had worked hard to achieve. Today he has served over 21 years in various roles and his love for his job remains as bright as ever. What led to me becoming a doctor must have stemmed from some childhood desire because I don't ever remember wanting to do anything else. I enjoy doing other things, but this has always been foremost in my mind. So going through high school, there weren't even other options that I considered. It might be something to do with our family doctor that we met, I don't know, some subconscious influences, uh, or the fact that my mom worked with doctors her whole life. But certainly, I think deep down, there is a desire to work within a community setting and to work with people in a way that you help them. And what was right in front of me at the time was become a doctor. Much of who Taslim has become can be put down to his parents who inculcated a love of reading and religion in the lives of their children. This had a positive effect on the lives of his siblings and him with two of them in the medical field and one in property. Taslim was a very obedient child, very disciplined and uh, very studious. I'll tell you exactly when they were small, when they started to get uh, their content subjects. I told them that you study your content subjects every day. And they were, they were reared like that. They were reared to do maths. They have to do it every day. They were bookworms, put it like, that way. When I asked them to do things, yes, mommy, we're going to do it now. But they will sit with their books. And now he and Walid will tell me, you know, mommy, when you used to say nine o'clock is lights, lights, lights out, then uh, we wait until you're gone. And we had a torch with us. <laughs> we'll shine the torch and we will read our books. So, um, I mean, they weren't children that will go out and be wild. But I think the final or the most important part of them becoming studious in that way is that our dua that we make. Mm -hmm. We ourselves as parents are not the means for them to be what they are. It's through Allah's the mercy and Allah's favors that we beg from Allah Ta'ala through the five times Salah that we inculcated in our own lives and in their lives. That Allah Ta'ala granted that the quality to achieve what they've been achieving, all of them. In 2020, the Western Cape Health Department set up a field hospital to deal with the increasing number of patients who required hospitalization due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For the head of department, there was one person most suited to the task. I was requested to put together a team to work in the Hospital of Hope. And um, we essentially we were looking for people that had sufficient gravitas that could lead a team of very young professionals in a very stressful environment. And I approached Taslim and his colleague from UCT, Klaus von Presenten. And uh, the two of them then said they would do it as a, as a collective. And uh, it was mainly because of his, his status as an academic and as a family physician that I approached him to lead the team and to put the team together. Taslim has had the benefit of having had many great mentors and this has shown in his work ethic. Colleagues and fellow professionals praise his ability to navigate various roles in the line of his work. Well, Taslim has come a long way. I first knew him as a postgraduate student at UCT. Um, when I took over the, Depart the Division of Family Medicine, um, he came there as a postgraduate student in, I think he finished his degree in 2006, 7 um, And we got to know each other fairly well during that time. And I had my eye on him since then, you know, because he exhibited all the characteristics that I admired in a doctor. So, 
he then came back as a lecturer in 2010. Um, we were starting a new program at Friedenberg um, in the Western Cape on the West Coast. So we were planning a new venture by getting students out there to learn within a rural community, a semi-rural community. And he accepted that post uh, to start that program in Friedenburg. It was a big challenge. He had to root up his family from Cape Town and take that move there. So uh, I take my hat off to his whole family, his wife especially, and his children, and to him uh, for having made that significant move and making a difference in, in a poor community. Just like he has been mentored, he now wants to mentor and has a passion to help younger medical professionals. So where we are at the moment is at UCT, University of Cape Town, at the oldest medical school in the country, maybe in Africa. And my role is that I am the convener of all the postgraduate programs within the Division of Family Medicine. My role specifically is in ensuring that postgraduate students who enroll in our programs um, develop the necessary skills to be registered primarily as specialist family physicians who will then go out and work in district or community-based practices across the country. The network is becoming quite exciting to work in because this is now an opportunity from this role that I play, uh, an opportunity to impact on poor communities in a very, very widely spaced geographical area. As a clinician, I found I impacted in terms of the team, the clinical team that I led, I impacted on the community in which I worked. As an educator, wherever my students have an impact, I have some kind of hand in that. And I think in Islam, we are very well aware of the concept of sadaqatul jariya, sadaqah which lives on beyond your contribution. And education offers that uh, opportunity. I, I, I benefit from that all the time. Service to humanity has been an intrinsic value that has guided Taslim in all spheres of his life. The lessons he learned as a young person growing up is being passed on to his own children and their value system is enriched through this. We, the role of, of my parents in, in, in shaping who I've become it's something which you can't even start to explain. I think their role is so fundamentally important. They provide, uh, they provide still to this day, the kind of the foundation upon which we stand in real life. They provided not just a, a, an Islamic basis or a kind of spiritual basis to my thinking and my, who I am today. I don't know. Uh, I don't think one can quantify uh, the role that they've played. I, I wouldn't even begin to, to attempt that. Taslim had one other wish as a young boy, and that was to be a professional soccer player. Bafana Bafana may have benefited from his skills, but it would have been limited to a few short years. Humanity now stands to gain for a little while longer as the good doctor continues on his path in saving lives and uplifting society. Ramadan is a time of reflection and introspection. It allows us the opportunity to refocus our mind, body and soul and Zainab Ibrahim's wellness segment shares some tips on how to do this. I greet you with a universal greeting of peace. Today I'm going to speak about Ramadan and what it can teach us about self-development. So similarly, when we stack bricks on top of one another, it creates a wall, which creates a house, which creates a town, and eventually creates a city. So similarly, Ramadan is about the ability to build on our self-development. And when we do this, we not only benefit ourselves, but we benefit all of those around us. So I've always wondered, what can Ramadan teach me and how can it benefit me in my life today? And since the month of Ramadan is about the Qur'an and the Qur'an is filled with seeds of knowledge and if knowledge is power, then the fruits of knowledge lies in its understanding and its implementation. And we can only really ascertain sincerity through understanding. And I realize that since the Qur'an is about teaching us about the self, and if knowledge is power, 
then the knowledge of the self is self-empowerment. And therefore I've changed my approach because typically I would recite the Quran from beginning to end through the month of Ramadan and try and do this a few times over. And however noble this is, since many of us do that, my approach changed to focusing on just a few verses and rather focus on understanding and more importantly implementing its teachings as our religion really preaches doing less but doing it more consistent. And the difference really between someone that's really knowledgeable and someone that is ignorant is if the knowledgeable person is using the knowledge and implementing its teachings. So I've always wondered, what is this feeling that we experience when the month arrives? We feel at peace, we feel really calm and happy within. And I've realized that we've made the intention to be the best version of ourselves. We've made the intention to treat others better, to be aware of how we speak and how we interact. And what the result of that is, is that we're really very present, present in the moment, as the focus is not only on the act of not eating, but really trying to be the best version of ourselves. And that's really being present in the moment, being conscious of our creator, and ultimately conscious of who we are. And if we are able to achieve this, we've managed to put the SPI in front of the word ritual and become spiritual. Ramadan, I found, is very interesting as the act of fasting is really the absence of not doing something which is eating. And therefore, we automatically, when we are fasting, we assume that everyone else around us is fasting as well, which means we think the best of them and we hold them in high regard. And there's absolutely no judgment. So the question then is, what can I learn from this and how can I implement it in my life? And one of the things I've realized is that even the simple act of seeing someone, for example, not praying their five daily prayers, we shouldn't assume that they don't pray and really always choose to think the best of others. Ramadan is a really holy month. However, holier than that is the acts of the individual. And like everything in life, Ramadan will come to pass. However, what will remain constant is our consciousness and our connection to our Creator. And therefore, we should not make the mistake to worship the month of Ramadan, but rather worship our Creator. As we can achieve this beautiful connection, this present awareness, this tranquility and peace within, if we are always willing to develop ourselves. So my wish for myself and everyone else is that this month really rejuvenates us and revitalizes us so that we are inspired to live this way every month of the year. I hope to see you soon. Wishing you well. Goodbye. The Castle of Good Hope is the oldest building in South Africa and is also the venue of an exhibition on Cape Muslim heritage art. Let's go see what it's all about. The Castle of Good Hope is regarded as the oldest building in South Africa. It was built between 1666 and 1679 and has served as the seat of the colonial rule as well as a place of imprisonment and punishment. These days it serves as a monument filled with the history and legacy of the past. The Castle of Good Hope is of course the oldest colonial building in the country and it's still going on. So today it's no longer a military site, it's no longer an uh, office of the South African National Defence Force, but it's a declared heritage site. And my role is essentially to curate what is inside and outside the castle so that the castle, coming from a very difficult and harrowing past, is now a symbol of inclusion, of healing and of nation building instead of one uh, of exclusion and of, uh, you know, difficult uh, history and memory. A unique exhibition has been curated and can be seen within one of the castle's many spaces. The Cape Muslim Heritage Exhibition has a collection of the artworks and historical artifacts that showcase the history of Muslims in South Africa. The Cape Muslim Heritage Art Exhibition is actually a, a narrative that basically looks at, at the history 
of the Muslims in terms of how they interacted with one another and uh, of course how they interacted with the colonialists, uh, the people, the imperialists, the agents of apartheid and of course how they interacted with uh, in terms of their own liberation and how they act, interact up till today with, uh, with the current government. The exhibition is one of many interventions the castle's management have planned in helping to tell the story of all who once occupied this place. The, the significance of the castle as a place of memory, good, bad and ugly. So when we invite these um, thoughtfully put together exhibitions, exhibitions that make you think, exhibitions that make you talk, reflect, uh, engage, it is uh, significant that it's happening at the castle, that you bring people here to look back at the past, not in a vengeful way, but in a way that's uh, educating, that's uh, conversational, that's dialogical, and that's really building uh, a nation in a, in a significant way so that the world see it and that they don't keep it in the, in the backyards or in the you know, cupboards, but it's really opening up to, I, I would say, a, a knowledge-hungry nation. Ihsan Higgins is an attorney by profession, but a committed art collector, and his love for community can be seen through the many paintings he has commissioned and collected. 25 years ago, I started collecting pieces, you know, like buying a piece here, buying a piece there. And then I realized, you know, we actually need to, to put a story together. And then, of course, I started uh, looking at the, at the history. And I started, of course, there were gaps. And then once I understood the gaps, I got some artists, uh, we got them to, to start filling in the gaps because they are quite talented in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the craft. The idea is to get young people especially to understand where they come from and where they're going. And I especially want to, want to, want to emphasize you know, the relationships that people had with other groups. And it is very fortuitous that this exhibition is actually at the castle of Goodup, because this is where it all started. This is where people, the, the, the Malay slaves especially, and, uh, and I mean, the, the exhibition portrays all of that. So it's really a, an ode to the, to, the, to the contribution of Muslims in terms of getting to where we are today in South Africa. Another interesting space is the Imam Harun tribute, which was done to honor and pay homage to this anti-apartheid activist who was killed by the security police. In every community, there's a story to tell, and particularly focusing on the Western Cape and focusing on the death and the life and the legacy of my father. When the Imam Harun Foundation was launched, Kasim Khan, who's the director of the Imam Harun Foundation, we had numerous discussions as to how are we going to tell the story because with modern technology nowadays, you don't find students, elders, community people, or the broader community easily going to museums or place or galleries, depending if it's their passion. And we thought of a moving gallery, so with the Western Cape, uh, government heritage department, all thanks to them. We can say we proudly stand on the soil of the castle, which has much, much history and sad legacy itself and memories. But at least people from all walks of life will be able to be exposed through the, uh, this moving gallery as we stand here today. The Imam Harun exhibition runs together with the Dalsi September history, and it's all about uh, the martyrs uh, under apartheid and in colonialism. And so why we have the Imam Harun and Dalsi September um, exhibitions here is not only to educate, but also to liberate. In a sense, we say to the lawmakers, these cases are not cold cases. These cases are still alive. Let's open the archives. Let's open these dockets and let's look at who were the real, real culprits uh, causing the deaths of these uh, gallant fighters against apartheid and colonialism. 
the significance of this being a place of torture for so many is not lost on Imam Harun's daughter, Fatima and the family. The significance of this uh, exhibition is that the castle represents a dark period on the South African history in the Western Cape. It represents how people were tortured, how people were placed in dungeons, how people lied, how were ripped apart. If I think about my father's torture, how they tortured his entire body, the amount of bruises that was on his body, and even though when he was found dead and when they had to, when they washed his body, the amount of pain and suffering he had to endure during the time of his incarceration, he must have been in complete hell, and yet he was prepared to sacrifice. So if whoever comes and they move through this institution, such as the castle, every room in this castle has a story to tell, with an exhibition or without an exhibition. While the exhibition is focused on the Muslim contribution, it is hoped that those who visit are educated on the lives of those who were oppressed first under colonial powers and later under the apartheid government. Places such as the castle play an important role in retelling this history of all this country's people. Alhamdulillah, that's it for another week. Please tune in next week, same time, same place. Kinda Mari Mokwanda, Kiri Aribu Eri Bonanen Khape. Assalamu alaikum.